it's wonderful to have everybody back with us for our first of two um, Islington Reads that we're going to be having this fall. And beyond excited today that we have uh, Michael Crummy joining us all the way from Newfoundland. And um, as you know, he's going to be talking about the wonderful novel, The Innocence. And uh, Michael, um, welcome. Thank you again for coming in. We're glad that the storm wasn't uh, horrible and you didn't lose power and you're able to be with us uh, here tonight because I know a lot of us have been really excited to, um, uh, to hear you um, speak about your amazing novel. Um, this is our seventh uh, Islington Reads that we have uh, are, are now hosting and it's um, for Michael, as I sent you in an email, it is a joint a partnership between Islington United Church and the Novel Spa Bookshop. And it is a, um, a, a book club that's welcome to all ages, genders, and identities. And it's been great. We've seen our numbers grow uh, as each session goes. So it's been a lot of fun to, to see it um, move forward. And as um, Cynthia said, we have disabled the chat for during the um, for during the session with Michael, but we will enable it near the end before the breakout group. So I uh, appreciate that. We've had a lot of pre-submitted questions, so we're looking forward to hearing uh, Michael answer those um, as we move along with this uh, this session. So Michael, um, used, he was born and raised in uh, Newfoundland. He did move uh, to Labrador with his family for a while. Uh, and he has since moved back to um, St. John, Newfoundland, where he currently resides. Michael got his degree uh, at the University, Memorial University in Newfoundland, and then he went and got his MA at uh, Queen's University in Kingston. And after uh, doing a little bit of traveling and some um, English second language teaches, he, teaching, he ended up moving back to Newfoundland. And obviously, Newfoundland is in your blood, Michael, because the way you describe it in your books, and particularly in The Innocence, is absolutely amazing. Michael started out as a poet, uh, and then he moved on to writing uh, various novels. Uh, Innocence is his uh, fifth novel, and it is a, the, in the year of 2019, when it was first published, it was long listed for the Giller, the uh, Governor General Awards, and the Writers' Trust Award for Fiction. So, uh, kudos to you, Michael. You can definitely uh, put a sentence together. Um, so like I said, we are very, very thrilled to have you here tonight. Um, at this point in time, I'm going to say, uh, um, I'm going to pass it over to you, Michael, um, so you can tell us a little bit more about the writing of The Innocents um, and your process in, in making this book come together. We've got lots of questions out there about how long did it take you to write, um, and various other things. So I know you'll touch on what um, what needs to be, uh, what you want to say, and then from there we'll go on to the questions and start the uh, start the dialogue. So anyway, thank you, Michael, again, and without further ado, um, we'll bring in Michael. Okay, great. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, yes. all right. Um, thanks so much for, for the invitation to be um, part of this event. Um, I, uh, I don't, have you done Zoom events before? Is this, yeah, you have, yeah. I'm a big fan because um, I, I get to do these events all across the country and occasionally in other parts of the world, but I'm still at home. Um, and that, that suits me just fine, actually. Uh, hurricanes notwithstanding. Um, so I, 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 my understanding is that I, I'm going to talk for a little bit about the book and where the book came from and uh, some of what uh, I was trying to do in the writing of the book. Uh, and then um, I'll be happy to try and answer any questions that you, that you have for me. Um, I will admit that um, this is the first time in a while that I've uh, been asked to talk about the book. So I'm not sure how this is going to go. We'll see how much I can remember about it. Um, uh, I have said on a number of occasions um, that that this is a book that I really did not want to write. Uh, I, I and an, I avoided writing it or trying to write it uh, for years. Um, I first encountered the story. Um, at the archives in at the rooms in St. John's. And the rooms is um, uh, a combination of the Provincial Museum, the Provincial Archives, and the Provincial Art Gallery. And 
over the years, I have spent a lot of time in the provincial archives. Um, and I'm often in there uh, to research particular projects. But whenever I'm in there, I also spend a little bit of time just uh, poking around um, because it's full of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of little fragments of stories um, from Newfoundland's past. And uh, it's just uh, endlessly fascinating. And uh, the glimpses you get of people and of how people lived and the kinds of things they experienced while living here in Newfoundland over the last four or 500 years um, are uh, always uh, interesting in and of themselves. And they almost always spark something in me as well that makes me want to incorporate them into my own storytelling. And about 10 years ago now, I was in the archives doing some research for a little animated film about the great Newfoundland ceiling disaster of 1914. And uh, so I did that particular focused research and then I was just poking around. And I happened on a one paragraph description. And I can't remember now if this was uh, uh, written by the person who, who experienced this or was written by someone else who had heard the story. But basically it was the story of a traveling clergyman so this was way back at a time when most Newfoundland communities were too small and too poor to have their own church. So the clergy often traveled along the coast um, to minister to these tiny communities. And this clergyman in the process uh, of traveling along the coast happened upon an orphan brother and sister who were living alone in a, in a completely isolated cove. Uh, and uh, very quickly after uh, meeting the brother and sister, uh, it was obvious that the sister was pregnant. <clears throat> and the clergyman uh, automatically assumed, and I'm sure he was right about this, that the brother was the father of the child. And, uh, and this particular clergyman uh, uh, immediately got upon his high horse and really went after those youngsters for, for the sinfulness of what they had done. Uh, and in fact, he was so uh, uh, obstreperous and irate about it that the brother eventually drove him away with a, with a shotgun. Um, and that was the end of the, that was the one paragraph. That was everything uh, there was uh, about those two children. Um, uh, I, there wasn't anything to say how long they had been there alone, and there wasn't anything to say what happened to them afterwards. And I do remember having that feeling that I sometimes have in the archives that, oh, here, there's a story here to be told. That was my first thought. My second thought was, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. No, thank you. Um, so I just, I didn't, I didn't make a note of it. Uh, I don't know where I found it now. I couldn't find it again, probably if my life depended on it. And my plan was to completely forget about it. Um, and uh, I never managed to completely forget about it. And over the years that followed at different times, those youngsters would come back to me. And I, I think I was kind of haunted by them and uh, their story and my sense of what their experience of the world must have been like. And I often thought about them, particularly in the context of my own childhood, my own move through late childhood into adolescence. I was born in a, a mining town in Newfoundland in the mid 1960s. Um, so when I started moving into uh, puberty, um, I, there were resources available to me. Um, but we had, uh, when I was almost 13, my mom forced me to read a book called Almost 13. I still quite haven't forgiven her for that. Um, and uh, there was a sex education class in, in school. Um, 
myself and most of my uh, buddies were scrounged everywhere we could for skin magazines. Um, so there were there were places we could turn to try and answer some of the questions I had about what the hell was happening to me. In some, I don't know what it was like for you folks, but if, in some ways to me, it felt like I was being taken over by a, a second being that was me, but wasn't me at the same time, or that I was sharing the space with this new creature who uh, uh, I had some of the same ambitions as, but didn't quite trust this, this creature that I was living with uh, suddenly and strangely. And even though I knew all of my friends were going through the same sorts of things in one way or another, I do remember that time as uh, the most uh, confusing and in some ways the most appalling and certainly in some ways the loneliest time of my life. And I kept thinking about this brother and sister. I imagine that they had been left alone <clears throat> when they were too young to know what was coming before those changes had started coming over them. And that when those things started happening to them, they would have had no knowledge of what those things were or what they meant for them. And they have, would have had no one to turn to, to ask. And in fact, I imagined they wouldn't even have the language to ask those questions, even if there was someone for them to turn to, even if they felt like they could uh, bring it up with each other. The language to talk about it just wasn't available to them. So it felt to me like that it would have been an incredibly lonely experience for that boy and that girl, even though it was in some ways an experience they were sharing. And, uh, and I think uh, what I wanted to try to do was uh, to write my way through what that would have been like for them or what it might have been like for them. Knowing all along that trying to write about that was uh, just full of pitfalls and that there were 10,000 ways that that story could be told badly or that I could get things wrong, um, which is uh, you know, why I had avoided it for so long. Um, but in the end, I think I just felt like I wanted to try to get my sense of those two children on paper. And when I was thinking about their experience of the world, uh, uh, very early on, I started thinking about uh, the biblical story of Adam and Eve, of course. So the, the youngsters are Ada and Everett, and those, those are not accidental uh, names. Um, because it, it felt to me in some ways that the biblical story is of these two people who are uh, created and thrown into a world that they have some knowledge of, that there, there are bits and pieces that they, that they have uh, in terms of knowledge that allows them to survive in this world, but that to a large extent, they are blind to the world around them. And they're blind to their own natures. You know, and the one thing they're forbidden to do is to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it's talked about a blind, uh, talked about as a blindness in Genesis, right? That after they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's the first time that they're aware that they're naked. Before that, they're completely blind to that fact. And I felt like Ada and Everett, in some ways, share that same blindness about the world at large. They have a certain amount of knowledge, enough that they won't starve to death. But in terms of what the world is, what the world outside the cove is, and more importantly, in terms of their sense of who they are themselves, in many ways, they're completely blind to that. So the novel, in many ways, is me following them as they stumble around uh, 
blindly with their hands in front of them, trying to make their way forward through that world that becomes increasingly strange and increasingly uh, unsettling as they move through the seasons as brother and sister. One of the things I think I wanted to avoid when I was writing the book though, I did not wanna write a book about incest. That was the reason I avoided starting the book for years. Um, and it was the one thing that I went out of my way to try to avoid it being at the center of the book. To me, the sexual relationship between the brother and sister is just one more thing that happens to them in this whole series of strange things that force them to look at themselves or to look at the world differently than they had. Um, there are a whole bunch of uh, places in the book where you kind of see the scales fall from their eyes when they uh, are, are allowed or forced to look at the world or to look at themselves differently than they had. So uh, for me, anyway, I, I, believe, I feel like there's a fall in the book in the same way that, that there's a fall from grace in, in the Genesis story of Adam and Eve. There's a fall from grace in the novel as well, but it's not the sexual relationship between the brother and sister. Um, there, in a way, they kind of muddle their way through that and then find their way toward um, neutral corners on that whole issue. Um, for me, the fall in the book is uh, the growing sense that these children have that there's more to the world than just this other person that they're with. And for most of the, for most of the novel, um, Ada and Everett see each other almost as a single being. Um, and they certainly look upon each other as the reason they want to continue living. Like the reason those two survive those unbelievably difficult circumstances is because they want the other person to survive. Because they love that person and they want to be there to support and help that person. As the book progresses though, as they begin to see daylight between the two of them, um, that sense begins to fall away from them. And for me, the, the fall in the book the moment that I find most heartbreaking is uh, after the sailors come into the cove and they have this experience for, for uh, Everett, it's this communal experience of being around other men. For Ada, it's this experience of being shown an outside world by, uh, by the, the the Scottish sailor. When those sailors leave, for the first time in their lives, they look at it, one another and they think, I don't know if this other, this one other person is enough. I don't know if that's a complete world. I no longer am convinced that as long as I have this one person with me, that's all I need. And for me, that was the, the fall in the book. It was the fall from oneness and that fall from, that, from grace that they have of feeling like they are a complete whole alone together there. So in some ways, uh, not only did I not want this book to be a book about incest, um, I wrote it as a love story. Um, I wanted... I wanted the motivating factor through most of the book to be the, the love that these two siblings have for one another and how that love is what sustains them through uh, circumstances that are, that would be trying for any uh, people at any time of life, um, let alone two children left alone in this uh, incredibly, in some ways, unfriendly um, environment that Newfoundland, the coastal Newfoundland is still and, uh, 
and certainly was back at the, the turn of the 19th century. Um, so uh, I could talk a little bit more about the process and stuff like that of writing it, but I feel like I'm going on a lot here. So I don't, did, we, did you wanna open it up to questions at this point? So we had people pre-submit questions. So I've got a lot of pre-submitted questions that we can proceed to. Um, I'll ask them and then we will see where the conversation goes from there. Sure. But you touched a little, is that okay with you? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, I guess you've touched on it at the very beginning about the names and how the names were very, you know, chosen um, very, very carefully. So Ada certainly, um, when you look up what it means, it's first daughter. Um, it means they're noble, also a, a, an adornment. Um, Everett is uh, the strength of a boar and hard and ever has a hard and ever enduring personality. So those are the, the sort of the what the you know when you look at the research behind it, what a name means. So I thought that was really interesting. Ada is the first daughter, but also when you take the ADA, it is the first three letters of Adam, and yeah. when you Eve. ever read hit the first three letters of his name is Eve so when you were talking about the Adam and Eve story I thought that was very clever but also the fact that the names fulfill but the one question that sort of came up a couple of times is why Martha so what was your point there was Martha and why did Ada call her baby Martha because based on what they said the name Martha means it means someone who is bitter or provoking Mm. So I wondered if there was a if there was a specialist to the name Martha for you that's why you wanted to use it or was there a reason why Martha was the name chosen for for the babies? Right. Well, it's kind of uh, I you know I didn't actually know what the meaning of Ada or Everett was, but uh, hearing you just uh, describe the meanings of those names, it does seem kind of perfect for both of them. Um, um, but Martha was partly, uh, I had to find uh, a woman's name from the Bible because those would have been the only names that Ada would know. Uh, I already had a Mary. So uh, that, I couldn't use that. And um, my, my uh, longtime editor, who the book is dedicated to, is Martha Kenya Forstner. And my agent is uh, Martha Webb. So I, I kind of like sneaking them into the book that way, but there wasn't there wasn't a particular outside of it having to have been a, a biblical name, and there aren't a lot of of uh, female names from from the Bible, you know. So um, I had a very short list that I could pick from. Okay, so then. Uh, but it's interesting. I think it's neat the way that you've moved, you've moved the two Marthas from your writing world into the story. So um, that uh, that's really interesting. Now, going back to Mary. So we had a question here uh, with regards to Mary and how she plays such an important role. Sorry, I'm just, uh, yeah, in the first few pages, Mary foreshadowed that a good fright to a pregnant woman left a permanent sign on the body. And that's exactly what happened to the second Martha. Why did you decide to have the second baby born with such a sign? Well, um, I think uh, I was looking for a way to, um, uh, I mean, it's a cliche of incest that, that the, a, a child born of an incestuous relationship often has some kind of physical or uh, emotional or mental disability. So I wanted, I wanted the child to be marked in some way by that. Mm -hmm. um, but also um, those two youngsters, Ada and Everett, they remain innocent to the end of the book. You know, like they, neither of them really knows where this child came from. Even after it becomes clear that the child is coming, like Ada, has a better sense, of course. She's more clever than ever. And, uh, and she recognizes that it's a possibility that what happened between her and her brother is the reason that she's pregnant. But there are a couple of other possibilities that she thinks are just as likely, um, including the accident where her arm is, is, uh, is injured. And Everett assumes that uh, it's the Scottish seaman who is the father. 
because his only sense of fatherhood is um, his relationship to his father. And, you know, in his mind, he is his father's son in the way that the boat is his father's boat. So uh, I did also want for there to be a way to maintain that sense of innocence that the kids have. And yet for both of them to feel like uh, some, that they have some sort of mark upon the child. And, uh, and because Everett of course caused the injury to her sister, to his sister, he sees that mark on the child as his doing in some way. Um, so that was, that was the reason I think that I was wanting that, that child to be, to arrive in the world with that, that kind of baggage for lack of a better word. So, but the notion that, um, that a child, uh, is marked by, uh, an accident or a good fright, uh, to the mother while she's pregnant. That's something that uh, I grew up hearing. And uh, my mother, in fact, uh, believes that uh, when she was pregnant with my younger brother, Stephen, she fell on ice heading into the church. She was the organist at the church in Buckland. And she was going in to practice on a particularly cold morning. And there was icing, ice inside the vestibule. And she slipped on the ice and fell. And as she fell, she grabbed the back of her neck. And my brother, Stephen has a birthmark on the back of his neck. Um, and I've always, I've always, of course, loved these strange kind of almost otherworldly beliefs and happenings that, that Newfoundland is famous for. So when I was looking for a way to allow, for example, Everett to feel like this child belongs to him in a way without ever thinking that he's the father. That was a way for me to make that kind of connection between the two. Sorry, that was very long-winded and I'm not sure. No, but it's a fabulous answer. Thank you. That answer is okay. really great. So um, another question you had is how long did it take you to write The Innocent? So um, certainly, uh, we've heard uh, from other authors, they like to set their books in places where they really want to spend time to do their research, that type of thing. Um, and then that's why they particularly choose a setting. Obviously, you love Newfoundland, and you're very, very comfortable with Newfoundland as a setting, with just writing about the, uh, the weather or the environment. Um, but it's a cold, it's a very cold place, and this novel takes place a lot of the time in the cold. Did that hurry up your writing process in any way, shape, or form? But as you were living in a cold environment, I, you know, did that make you want to hurry it along, or did you just let the the novel take its its course in the writing process? Yeah, well, I mean, each of each of my novels, I've written five now, and each of them has felt completely different in terms of how they arrive for me, and how I feel about them while I'm writing them, and how I feel about them when I'm done with them. And with this book, as I've said uh, uh, several times already this evening, uh, was a book that I didn't want to write and had avoided for a long time. So when I finally decided uh, I was going to bite the bullet and do it, um, I decided I just wanted it done as quickly as possible. So uh, I, I did some reading, uh, about a month of reading. But again, uh, I had planned to like go to the archives and do a bunch of other things. But I just found three or four books in my library that seemed to suit the time that the story would probably be set in. Gave me a bunch of different characters who could show up in the cove. So I thought, in some ways, I thought that the cove was, the whole story happens in the cove. It's this, a tiny space that uh, the youngsters never leave. So I thought uh, in terms of research, I would treat my office as the cold. And I would, whatever I could find in my office was allowed to put in the book. Um, and 
uh, and that also uh, freed me up to uh, feel like I didn't have to spend more time researching. So I got that out of the way as quickly as I could. And then when I started writing, I just, I just wanted it done. So I wrote every day for three and a half months, um, which I've never done before. Uh, and at the end of that three and a half months, I was pretty close to a first draft. And then I would say another six weeks after that, I had a complete draft of the novel. Um, and then uh, I worked on it for maybe two months with my editor. And then I was more or less done. So from start to finish, it was less than, I'd say less than eight months. And that's completely unlike anything else I've experienced before. You know, it's usually a full year of writing just for the first draft, plus whatever months of research beforehand, plus then months and months of editing on the other side. So, uh, but I was quite happy uh, to, to be, to have it out of my hands as quickly as I did. All right, so that was a nice little foray into the next question. So the characters you wrote, they are just children uh, when they lost both their parents and they're continually uh, tried with new challenges throughout the book. So as a writer, was it hard for you to put the, these vulnerable characters through trials constantly? Like did that, I mean, obviously, as you said, it's been an, it was an emotional it was a book you avoided writing and eventually you put pen to paper and we're glad you did because it is, it, it's truly a brilliant, a brilliant novel. Um, but, you know, how, how did that affect you? You know, you're always putting these children through um, all these trials and, and, and tribulations. Um, yeah. I can imagine writing it, like. Right. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question because there, there are, it feels like there are two sides to that coin for a writer. You know, in one sense, uh, I'm wanting to write a book that's, interesting and that will make those characters interesting so you want to provide them with uh, plenty of challenges that show them uh, operating as independent human beings in a challenging environment in a way that it draws a reader in and allows them to feel like they have a sense of these characters as real people and that's a kind of that's almost an aesthetic issue right that's a, like what do I do to these characters or with these characters as a writer that will make them interesting to a reader that will carry a story along? The other side of it is the emotional side of it. And, uh, and that's a totally different experience, you know, in terms of going through those experiences with characters that in some ways you feel some emotional connection to. You know, that you feel like, like, I wanted to write a book for, just as a, an example, I wanted to write a book that would do exactly the opposite of what that clergyman did when he encountered those orphans, right? I wanted to write a book that would never judge those, those children for the choices that they made, uh, even when they make bad choices. Um, and that at the end of the book, what I wanted was for a reader to go away feeling like the, the dignity of those two people was intact and that they would be able to have respect for those two people. So when you're making decisions about, uh, in some ways that's like a, that's, that's almost a, a parental <laughs> feeling that I had for those kids. So uh, putting them in situations where uh, physically or more, more often emotionally they're made vulnerable or where you see them struggling through things that there are no real answers for. Um, that I found really difficult. And I think in some ways uh, I, was, I was revisiting as I've hinted, you know, I was revisiting parts of my own childhood um, in, in writing the story of this brother and sister. And, uh, and so that was, diff 
that was incredibly interesting and also uh, emotionally very challenging and something that I was glad to be done with as, as quickly as I was done with it. If that answers your question. Okay, yes, it does. So <laughs> that's interesting because obviously you get the male voice very well and ever read obviously from your past, your experiences growing up and you put that into the, into the story. How did you find writing Ada's voice? Like, did you, because really she is the main female character in the whole story. Did you find it hard to find her voice or did her voice come to you quite naturally? Or did you have to do some extra research into, you know, um, what, what her voice would be like as a, as a young woman? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think they both came pretty naturally to me. Um, I don't feel like I had to struggle with one more than the other. Um, and I think that in some ways, I mean, in some ways, both of those children are partly me, you know, and Everett uh, is a particular uh, sort of uh, bore of a character who is like, um, he, he would have been quite happy to go on with that life in the cove indefinitely, you know, he just thought, well, this is the way the world is and, um, and I, I get up every day and this is the job in front of me and this is what I do. Um, and Ada is much more like me in the sense that she has a, an aesthetic sense of the world, an, art, an artistic sense about the world, and a sense that there must be more to the world than whatever it is that's right here. Um, so, in, so there were ways in which uh, Ada felt more natural to write than ever it did you know, uh, in terms of my sense of myself as a youngster. But in terms of her experience as a young, as a young woman, becoming a young woman, moving out of childhood into adolescence, um, it partly, uh, I, have, uh, I have always been interested in women's stories. Um, and that's been true from the time that I was very young. And I have spent a lot of time uh, asking about and listening to those stories. Um, I have two daughters as well. So I had a front row seat for some of the kinds of things that, uh, that girls go through on that path. And I do think, uh, I do remember being interviewed by somebody who said, uh, who wanted to know how I could possibly know that much about what it's like for a girl um, moving through those things. And I, I, I remember telling her about hearing um, uh, an interview with a mystery writer whose name I've forgotten. And I'm sorry uh, because I keep quoting this guy. But um, the, the interviewer wanted to know how he could possibly know so much about so many things. Uh, you know, to do with crime and to do with policing and all that sort of stuff. And the guy said, you know, when, when I'm writing a scene where a guy is picking a lock, I don't have to know how to pick a lock. I have to know enough about picking a lock to convince the reader I know how to pick a lock. And those are two very different things. So I feel like when I'm writing uh, a character like Ada, I don't have to know what that experience is like from the inside. And if I can't know, it would be impossible for me to know what it's like from the inside. But I have to know enough about what that experience is like from the inside to convince a reader, particularly women readers, <laughs> that I know something about what that's like. And, uh, and that's, it's, it's sort of a sleight of hand, almost. It's almost like a magic trick that, that I think good writers are able to do. And I hope that I am able to do for the most part, you know? So with Ada, it was kind of uh, always just wanting her voice and her experience of the world to, to feel authentic. And, if, and I felt like I had uh, reams of uh, moments and conversations and experiences with the women in my life 
um, that allowed me to pick bits and pieces to, to, to make that feel real for people. Excellent. So now taking that, we're going to look at the kind of like the, the, the landscape and the weather. And it was almost like a character in the, in the novel. Um, but you are meticulous on that. I mean, I know you say you've got an idea of what um, girls are like to be able to write about them. You're somewhat knowledgeable. But when it comes to the actual weather um, um, uh, and the landscape that you're dealing with, I mean, that is you try to keep that as authentic as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, so I, when you write about the cove, I mean, is there a particular cove that you have gone and walked in right. or tried to in in or... Um, to actually get the description or watch the wet. I mean, obviously you watch the weather come in all the time yeah, um, yeah. this past weekend, but it just, it's like, what other research do you do into the, the landscape and the weather for this book? Was there any other research or is it just because you've lived it most of your life that it's just innate in you? Yeah, a lot of it is just living here. And, and I do think, like I lived in Ontario for almost 13 years. And um, I think that moving home uh, was a real, it was really helpful for me to be living here in Newfoundland for the last 20 years because just living in the, in the landscape and experiencing the weather as it happens and being on the water, all, all of that adds to the, the weight that I can bring to my descriptions of the place. You know, like a lot of times now, when I was writing about Newfoundland as a younger man, especially when I was writing about my father's experience of, of being uh, a fisherman as a young boy and a teenager, um, I didn't have a lot of personal experience to bring to that, um, to that writing. But now as a much older man who spent a lot more time living in Newfoundland and have experienced uh, the complete range, I think, of what Newfoundland can do to a person living here. Um, I feel like I have a, a wide range of um, uh, experiences and colors and moments that I can draw on when I'm writing these scenes. You know, like I've I've experienced a couple of hurricanes here now. You know, so when I was writing the the scene of the youngsters uh, uh, caught in that hurricane that basically destroyed their the cold around them. Um, I mean, I was drawing on my own experience of living through a hurricane here, here in Newfoundland. Um, and I think that that lived experience, I'm also, I mean, and I will say that I also steal from other people as uh, whenever I can. So, um, the books that I had read uh, from around the turn of the 19th century, um, those books uh, often describe what the weather was like and how extreme it was and what it was like to live through those, those uh, times of really uh, horrific weather. And whenever I see something in there that I think is particularly good at presenting, a, a, an element of that weather or that landscape, um, I, I'm certainly not above stealing that and putting that in the book. Okay, good for you. <laughs> a quick question that came in, which sort of off topic, because we are, I know we're starting to get close to, close to the end of the, the hour. Um, and certainly we've been living through the pandemic and disease. So one question that came in is disease plays a major part in the story. Infectious disease presumably killed both parents and the first baby Martha. Everett and Ada also caught something from the sailors on the Hope. Everett and Ada also had what sounds like significant scurvy. Did you base your descriptions of the infectious diseases on known occurrences of diseases at the time of the story in Newfoundland? Uh, not specifically, no. Okay. Um, I mean, if you've read any of Newfoundland's history or any accounts of, of uh, European settlers in Newfoundland, from the 17th century on, those kinds of experiences are endemic, like they're unavoidable. Um, I was just looking at a, a recent uh, book that just came out about um, 
Monta Vista. And one of the first things I, I came across there was uh, an account of um, uh, a plague of the measles that moved through the community one fall and just uh, killed one after the other. Um, you know, that there were, and in this tiny community, there would be three funerals in one day, you know, and that people just died of diseases constantly. Um, and there was nothing they could do about them. That's the other thing I think that has always really struck me about early settlement in Newfoundland. And uh, not even just early settlement, but right up until the age of antibiotics in Newfoundland, that there was really nothing people could turn to other than superstition um, to try and protect themselves from these sort of uh, ongoing waves of one infectious disease or another, or one disease caused by malnutrition or another. Um, so as I was writing, as I, was writing I, I knew that part of what those children would have to deal with, part of what they would suffer through, uh, would have been would have been rounds of these kinds of uh, life, absolutely life threatening diseases. Okay, so that sort of is a good foray into our next question. Um, the healing. So in the process when um, Everett is, is sick and then also when Ada has the bad burn, um, I guess um, they were on pages 126 and 268 are some examples. Ada soaked and boiled hard tack and made a poultice for uh, a bread mixed with lamp oil to apply to Everett's eyes. Like how would she have known to do that? And then the other thing is Everett made uh, bread plastered with molasses and rum and cod liver oil for the burn. So I found those very interesting, like where, right. how did they learn that? I mean, they were nine and 11 or eight and 10 when their parents died. Right. Oh, you learn things by osmosis, but how would they have known to put those ingredients together or did they not um, right. deal with these diseases and, and, and illnesses? Right. Well, I mean, they certainly would have seen some of that at, in their childhood, right? Because um, their parents would have known those were, uh, those were the most common folk cures for things like uh, the flu or for colds or for burns. So uh, there's no question that they would have experienced that before their parents died and that they would have seen some of that sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, so I think a lot of it would have been uh, just improvisation as uh, like knowing that these were the kinds of things that were thought of as medicinal in some way and then uh, just taking them and uh, throwing them together in a mash that they would then hope often wrongly uh, would be some sort of relief for the person that they're they're trying to help but yeah it, it would have been just having seen their parents use them in some sort of concoction and then uh, improvising on their own to try and do the best they could with what they had. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess the final question, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this because I had a number of people um, request this question. During the pandemic um, and, and in Newfoundland and being housebound and would, was it a creative uh, period for you or was it a not very creative period for you? I know some people have thrown themselves into writing, other authors have not picked up the pen at all. So just yeah. wondering, Maybe there's another book in the works right? down the road? Uh, well, I, I have to say um, that uh, I mean, my joke about it, and I hope it's not too uh, flip, but my joke is, has been from the beginning that uh, I've been training for the pandemic my entire adult life. Uh, <laughs> And that I, I spent a lot of my adult life sitting alone in a room. And uh, so in some ways the pandemic didn't uh, require me to make a huge change to how I live my life. So I, I think I may have come through it uh, uh, not unscathed, but less scathed than some people. Um, 
in terms of the whether it was a creative time i mean i think i did a lot of things that that all of us did and my hair got way too long and i started baking bread and uh um in the last round of lockdowns i started um uh, making uh shelves and bedside tables and um, vanities and stuff out of pine just to try it so in that in that sense it's been a, a weirdly creative time in a way that i find really interesting i have been working on a, a book of poetry that is going to be coming out next fall um but that, that's something I've been working on for about seven or eight years. Um, and uh, it did afford me a very concentrated period of time to spend a lot of time with that book. Um, but that may have been the case even if the pandemic had never happened. I don't know. Well, we'll look forward to that because you absolutely, so I've got some of my, I've, um, one of my favorite passages in, in, the, in your novel. And it was on page 184 and it says, she went through uh, the contents of her shelf, culling the shelves and rocks and feathers that had lost their luster. Objects that had once possessed a hint of magic and, or beauty or mystery and now seemed merely ordinary. It, it was confounding to see magic and beauty and mystery leech out of a thing to think it could be used up like a store of winter supplies. So that is one of my favorite lines from the, the whole book. And so so again, you're saying you're going into poetry. I can't wait to see what your poetry, you know, your new collection of poetry is going to be next uh, next season. So um, I guess it, we're coming to a close here. So I'm going to ask Cynthia to open up the chat so people can say their, their thanks. But I just want to say thank you, Michael, from the bottom of my heart and from everyone who has uh, has tuned in to, tonight. Thank you for taking the time to, to zoom in from Newfoundland to tell us about the innocence and and the inspiration behind the story and why you had to write it and why you did write it. And um, like I said, it's just been a tremendous hour. So thank you very, very much. We really, really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Yeah, that was a real pleasure. And, and I, now I, I will pass it over to, help. and I will pass it over to Maya as well, because I know Maya wanted to say a couple of words. I just wanted to say, Michael, the privilege when I hold the story of that preacher, just summer, that paragraph piece of how when a church embraces a, a piece, a, a written piece, it holds a mirror to us. It continues to lift up for us how we have been part of a story that's harmed. And I feel the weight of responsibility with some in this community here of how we build safe spaces to hold our innocence um, and particularly in a time where every child matters and the way you've held these two for us in this story and the way you were vulnerable in sharing parts of your own story that often the church hasn't been a safe place to talk about what it means to come of age. Um, and so we just hold all of that in gratitude for this time and space. And many of us here are walking with little ones who are growing into adolescence and looking back on our own lives and in the child within us, in all of us, and um, the power of a story and a place to help us heal. So I just want to say thank you um, for also drawing those lines to us a biblical story that we kind of know um, and need to be reminded of the ways that can be reinterpreted and held uh, in a new way. So thank you for uh, not only those that are here tonight, but lots who have read the book and will have a chance to, to hear your reflections uh, later on our website. So I just want to um, want to say deep gratitude and uh, to remind you that the work you're doing alone in your room is helping many heal once it's released. Um, and the words of a poet that was brave enough to also step into story um, continue um, to inspire us and also to encourage us to write our and tell our own stories. So bless you into the next work. Um, and just thanks for sharing your time with us tonight. Thank you very much. It's our thanks. privilege. Yeah.